Hi, my name is Daphna Shohami. I'm a neuroscientist at Columbia University. And today I've been asked to explain memory at five levels of increasing complexity. My research aims to understand how memories are created and how they shape who we are, what we do, and the decisions we make. We're here today to talk about memory. When I say the word memory, what, what comes to your mind? Like, I once went on vacation to Dominican Republic. I think I was like six or five years old. So on your trip, what was the funnest day ever? There's this pool, I love pools. And then there's a slide you can go down, and then there's pool noodles there too, and then there's a little tiny sandbox. It's pretty amazing, right? Because it happened like a year or two ago. Our memory is basically a record in our brain of something that happened in the past, but that record it created isn't perfect. So that day, do you remember, was the pool at your hotel? I. I don't really remember. Do you remember from that day what color towel you used when you got out of the pool? I think the one I used was a dark blue or a light blue or, or like sort of a teal. When you were telling me about the sandbox, it felt like you didn't have to make that guess that you could just see the sandbox in your eyes. I asked you about the towel. It doesn't come to mind immediately, but you can stop and think about it and kind of make a good guess because there are things you know about the world. And for those of us who study memory, that's a really strong hint as to how memory works. And so for you, your memory kept all the fun stuff and all the stuff that was important to you. But the details like, did you have to have a ticket to get in or how you got there, all these other less interesting, less exciting aspects, your brain kind of decided, I'm letting go of all that information. I think as you get older, you start forgetting things more because you have to make space for new things, which is why you forget stuff. Yeah, that's a great insight, basically. We can't remember everything. So when you tell us this memory of that vacation, and your brain is able to kind of play almost this movie of a memory, a moment, a day that you had in your life a while ago. Where do those memories come from? I do know that there's different parts of the brain, so there's probably a part of your brain that remembers a bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. The hippocampus is a part of your brain that if you kind of took it out and looked at it, it looks a lot like a seahorse. And it plays a really important role in creating those kind of memories that help you, two years after your vacation, share with me um, what happened that day, all these details of, of that day. There's another part of the brain it's actually also important for memory, and it's called the amygdala. And it is important for keeping all the kind of emotional processing going for memory. So memory for things that are really scary, it's gonna to talk to the hippocampus now and get that memory to be really strong. Why do you think it might be important to remember scary things? Let's say you, you accidentally cut yourself then your brain makes a note and says, don't get too close to sharp things or you're going to cut yourself again. You got it. And so we don't just remember everything and we don't remember random things. We remember the things that matter to us the most. So Abigail, based on our conversation today, can you tell me what is a memory? A memory is something stored in your hippocampus and your hippocampus is a part of your brain. It's just a big record. And sometimes you can forget parts of the record that's not that important to you. You got it. What do you know about memory? I know when you see something, you get to like, kind of like picture it, like in your head, you can imagine it. I remember yesterday, I got like orange juice. But let's say like a year or two, you might think like, oh, that day I got water. You know, on one hand, memory is like an, a record of something that happened in the past that we can carry with us and we can like bring it back to mind. And on the other hand, we need to be a little bit suspicious sometimes because we might get it wrong. In what world would that memory of the orange juice maybe be useful? Let's say you grow up in a place that the orange juice is just eh, and then you go on vacation going somewhere and then it might like change how you feel about orange juice. Sometimes, you know, memory is doing something much simpler but no less important for us which is it's helping us figure out what's good and what's bad 
And if we can remember what's good and what's bad from what we did in the past, that can help us make decisions about what to do next time. So Dylan, you may be surprised to learn this, but we asked your mom what some of your favorite candies are. So you have to make a decision between these two candies. And whichever one you pick, you actually get to take with you. I wish I could say both, but uh, I guess I'll go with Pixie Sticks. There you go. There's your decision. Okay, you can take okay. those. <laughs> yeah, it took you some time there. You look like you were really working hard at that problem. And that's interesting because actually we know that from research that when people have to make a decision between two things they like equally, some people like economists think, oh, those are the easiest decisions because they're both good options. But as psychologists and neuroscientists, we know it's the opposite. And one of the reasons is because there's no simple answer of like, I know that, that one's better, I'm just going to go with it. And so we think that that's the kind of decision where memory is especially important because you have to kind of come up with more information. Exactly. And then also like after is like, Maybe like I would have enjoyed this more than that. And like maybe I should have chose the other one and you don't know. Everything you just said is exactly what we know from research. All the thoughts running through your mind were really a kind of about a prediction into the future, right? You were like, how, how will this taste if, when it's in my mouth? Or how will I feel about my decision down the road? You know, we think of memory as something in the past, but it's an example of how you use your memories of these two candies to predict what's going to happen in the future so that you can make a decision in the present. But you did it. You made your way through that yeah. um, torture, and now you've got to keep the candy. Am I always going to, like, choose Pixie Sticks or Sour Patch Kids? What's going to, like, change that? We fluctuate a lot because we use different kinds of memory to kind of resolve the uncertainty, basically, every time. But also the way we make decisions will change because our memories change. What's interesting about your brain as a teenager is that we know it's actually a phase of life where the brain is especially sensitive to rewards, to things that are exciting and positive. It's a phase of life where those rewards, whether it's candy or your friends or whatever it is that's exciting, can have an especially powerful control over the decisions you make and the memories you create. Is there any particular memory for you that you feel has been either kind of influential in, your, in deciding which areas to pursue or that you feel is sort of emblematic of what it is to have a memory? I was probably six years old and my aunt who had stage four ovarian cancer, she battled it for 20 years. She got me my first science kit and she asked me to cure cancer. And I will never forget running into my aunt's room and just opening up the box and seeing that microscope. It was a tiny little blue one. And the little microscope slides and the little pipettes. And it just, that memory will never be forgotten my whole life. I've got one too. I was nine and we were at the Science Expo in San Francisco. Two scientists were dissecting um, uh, an eye, a cow's eye. And I was like, that is the coolest thing <laughs> I've ever seen. And there's something about that that carried me forward. Something happened so long ago, it left some long lasting trace through neural circuits, and it continues to shape the decisions we make about what to study and what to do. Just being able to apply those memories in the future is just so crucial in everyday life of the humans and the fact that we're learning how that works. And I would love to hear more about your side of memory and the mechanisms that you're studying. So we're interested in the idea that memory is kind of pervasive um, force that shapes all our behaviors. And we're trying to understand how different kinds of memory are organized in different structures of the brain, and then to understand how those different structures work together to orchestrate complex cognitive behaviors like decision-making or reasoning and thinking. So in your research, are you focused more on implicit or explicit memory? My work has actually kind of pushed against that distinction between memories that uh, kind of are consciously accessible versus unconscious. When you say that you don't necessarily look at implicit and explicit memory as anything different, if you were to take a step back, what would you define as implicit and explicit memory? The best way to kind of think about that distinction really goes back historically to one of the most important discoveries in memory research. The patient is referred to uh, famously as patient HM. The neurosurgeon went in and removed the tissue that happened to be right around the hippocampus on both the left side and the right side 
of HM's brain. But then they started noticing something odd in his behavior. He was not able to create new memories of the experiences he had after the surgery. And that led Brenda Milner and her colleagues to report that the hippocampus was very important for memory, but of one particular kind, these sort of explicit or as we now refer to them, episodic memories. But that the hippocampus was not necessary for learning skills like mirror tracing, things that you can't necessarily articulate, but you just get better at over time. And it really led to a couple of decades or more even of an enormous amount of very important work that kind of kept on breaking memory down further and further into different types, episodic and semantic as both forms of explicit memory, where episodic refers to memory for an event that happened, like what you did yesterday morning, and semantic refers to general knowledge about the world. Implicit memory is being broken down into a bunch of different kinds, like skills or habits or conditioning. Uh, and when I started graduate school, many of us felt kind of the next question was really to understand how do we now understand how they work together? This was right around when functional magnetic resonance imaging started becoming a popular uh, tool for measuring brain activity. We could scan the entire brain and we could ask questions about multiple brain regions at once. And we discovered that when we might expect during a skill learning task that only the striatum might show activity, that we also saw activity in the hippocampus. Or when we asked someone to form an episodic memory that we thought might depend only on the hippocampus, we suddenly also saw activity in the prefrontal cortex. And so the confluence of these new ideas and questions about how different forms of memory interact, together with the development of new tools for studying the human mind and brain, allowed us to kind of adjust our view of memory systems to think of them less as multiple completely separate independent systems and instead to try to understand how they really work in concert with each other and give rise to all kinds of behaviors that might not fit neatly into one category or another. Are the connectivities that you're seeing using the fMRI in your studies, are they different when you look at the implicit and explicit memories? Are you seeing more activity in the striatum in comparison to the hippocampus or the prefrontal cortex? Yeah, you know, things are kind of breaking down in unexpected ways, I'd say. I think there's been a lot of really great work out of multiple labs showing hippocampal activity related to behaviors that don't look anything like episodic memories, but which might depend on episodic memories, right? So, for example, also when you're making a decision about how to choose between two good options, that suddenly you might see activity in the hippocampus related to the choice itself. Others have found that you find activity in the hippocampus not only when people are forming memories, but also when they're imagining events that are gonna happen in the future. So it kind of forces us to rethink the way we define what the hippocampus might be doing in a way that can account for creating memories, thinking about the future, making decisions, and other kinds of um, behaviors that involve what we would refer to in the field as uh, relational processing. Um, and that raised all kinds of new questions about what memory really is. Reminiscing about our early influences that made us want to be scientists is that, you know, of course, we know, we know better than to think that those are necessarily accurate memories. You know, this reminds me of sort of the classic example from literature when people talk about memory, of course, is Marcel Proust's um, Madeleine in Remembrance of Things Past, where in the book it's this um, uh, taste uh, for, the, for the protagonist, this taste of the crumbs of the Madeleine cookie in the tea that bring him back to his childhood, you know, seven volumes then emerge of memories of, of that childhood. Digging further into earlier drafts of Proust's novel, that initially it didn't describe a Madeleine at all. It's very interesting to see the imperfections of the human brain and being able to rewrite something that happened to you and fully believe it yourself. I think that that's one of the coolest errors and faults in the human brain that could exist. You know, I think these imperfections, I interpret them as an indication that the, the role of memory is much less about being accurate representation of the past and much more about being kind of a flexible compass into the future. So what are you studying these days? 
Well, um, I'm preparing my dissertation. The general topic is going to be how we perceive different types of social stimuli, like different people's faces and make judgments about them, and how the way that we report on what we are experiencing tells us about what's actually going on inside our heads. What I love about what you were describing is like, if you didn't use the word memory, which how you were talking about kind of perceptions and social judgments, but I think probably we'd both agree that memory is a big part oh, of that, of course. right? Like, and it reminds me so much of you know what we in the field would refer to as statistical learning. On one hand, we might have like a one-shot memory, a memory of something that we saw yesterday, like what we did or what we ate or where we were, but a lot of our memories and our knowledge instead are based on many, many, many experiences. Oh, absolutely. Um, I think this sort of reminds me of another project that I'm doing. It's fairly easy to get different participants to experience consistent negative emotions to the same stimuli. But with positive emotions, it's so much harder to study. I might not react the same to like this like cute cat video than someone else. And I definitely believe that people's memory that they're bringing up unconsciously when they're experiencing something to make an emotional judgment informs especially our experience of positive emotion possibly mm. more than negative emotion. Some of those examples really remind me also some of the questions about kind of abnormalities in, in memory or trauma or disruptions in memory and how they also play out in terms of not just what people remember, but what they do with, with those memories, right? As far as the way that my research plays into it is like the first step in making a judgment about what to do based on an experience we're calling from memory is deciding what your emotional response was. I think what we're still kind of trying to understand as a field is the more uh, kind of detailed and bigger picture of where does this model live? How does it get updated based on experiences? Why does that sometimes happen and sometimes not? There are actually people who are born without a hippocampus. They have disruptions to episodic memories. They have trouble after this conversation or remembering what the conversation was about. But they do have pretty good semantic information. They have a good sense of knowledge about the world. And that's interesting for two reasons. One, it shows this dissociation between the role of the hippocampus and these two forms of memory, episodic memories and semantic memory. But the other reason it's interesting is that people often assume that we get to semantic memory through episodic memory, that we encounter one dog and then another dog and then another dog, and then we learn the concept, the semantic notion of a dog. And these people, their profiles suggest that you can learn semantic information, you can learn general knowledge about the world, even without ever having the capacity to build those individual memories. In people with intact brains, you might use a particular process, but that if that brain region that subserves that process is damaged, that it's not that you can't do it anymore, you just now do it a different way. Right. It's really hard to tell people, like, just don't use your memory to do this. And we just sort of have to infer and guess at what strategies that they're doing. Right. If there is a particular research question that the answers you think is going to inform the research in your lab and perhaps in the rest of your field. You know, when I look back at, at some of the work from my own lab and in the field in general, I really feel like some of the most exciting discoveries were not an answer to a question that was around before, but they were discoveries that made us realize we weren't asking the right question. I think one example of that even has to do with the connection between memory and decision making. There was a discovery about how the stratum responds to rewards and to learning that just all of a sudden flipped the way we thought about the role of reward in learning and memory and may force us to realize there was something fundamentally connected between these processes. And that discovery just raised a whole new set of questions that didn't exist before. Yeah, I guess then the trick is we need to be designing studies that will make us most likely to find those sort of unexpected things, which is kind of funny. It's like, how do you look for something that you don't know what it is? Each project should be very focused and rigorous and know what a study is designed for. But at the same time, we have to keep our minds open, our eyes open for what else is happening. Some of the most interesting discoveries 
didn't make sense at first. As someone who is studying social phenomena, I, I like to hear that. There you go, exactly. Thanks so much for coming. Um, it's great to see you. It's been a while. It has been a while. I'm really excited to be here. It would be great to just um, start by talking about your work at, at, at the broadest level. To my mind, your work has really revolutionized the field of cognitive neuroscience more broadly. I've been really interested in how it past understandings of the brain have really focused on, on pinpointing exactly what each piece of the brain does. But I think that there's also a broader conversation happening in the brain, um, which is between one region and another. So it's actually the pattern of connections between these regions that would allow for the flow of information. But I think the tools that have become widely available now from the physics community and mathematics and, and computer science are under the umbrella of, of network science. So that is a science of networks, a science of understanding how um, bits of a system are interconnected with one another. Not just comparing two groups of people or two Two kinds of two species, but we can ask even within a single person, how does the pattern of connectivity in my brain change as we talk with one another? How does the information flow change? I think a lot about traffic on roadway networks as a good example of this, which is, you know, we can understand where the roads are, and perhaps the roads are relatively fixed. They change over long time scales, and that's similar to the brain. We really only create large scale connections over long time scales, but we can alter the traffic on the roadways really easily. And, and that's similar to what we do in, in the brain is that we change the way that information is flowing to allow us to respond um, to our environment. It's a great analogy. You know, I remember when I first learned of your work, for me as somebody who studies learning and memory, which are processes that are all about rapid updating, that to me was really mind-blowing, that we can now start asking questions about dynamics of circuits on a time scale that's much closer to the time scale of human thought um, than anything we had before. The field is definitely opening up in the kinds of questions that can be asked now with these approaches. Um, and I think what you're pointing out is that conceptually it's where we wanted to go anyway. So if there's so much orchestration that happens. Um, and a symphony is not a single piece. It's not a single pattern of, of harmony between instruments. And, and similar to the brain, um, symphony of your brain is not a single pattern. It's a very dynamically changing pattern. In the field, we often talk of um, uh, have, having a mental model um, that we use to make predictions about what's about to happen and really use that to mean kind of a general understanding of what's going on. What does that look like in terms that come from your world of like the configuration of, of a circuit? I think this is the most exciting area of memory research right now, I think, which is um, how people build and remember, you know, and keep with them models of the world over long periods of time. When I think about a mental model, I think about um, ideas, uh, potential outcomes, potential events, potential actions, and how they all depend on one another. So when we predict what will happen next, it would be, I am currently sitting at this piece of the network, and I know that there are, there are these possible outcomes, and so I have to get ready for those you know, four possible outcomes. But that brings this interesting question uh, to the fore, I think, which is, how does a network system in our mind, in our brain, create a network model of the world outside. It's almost like there's a reflection in the structure of what's inside in the hardware and what we're building in a very abstract way. Um, and I think that relates to some interesting work that's coming out about the hippocampus too. We now think of the hippocampus um, so much in terms of memory, and, but really some of the earliest work in neuroscience on the hippocampus uh, talked about the role of the hippocampus in spatial navigation. And it really exposed, I think, one of the deepest questions in memory research, or at least from the neuroscience perspective, is like, well, what is the connection? What is the connection between spatial processing um, and memory? And um, why is it that neurons in the hippocampus, when an animal is navigating a maze, why is it that there's spatial specialization? There? I really do think that um, this notion of a, a mental model, a generative model, is where those, where, where memory and space meet. That makes a lot of sense. And I think that um, 
it makes me you know, wonder how we think about places in the abstract. What is a cognitive place, right? And what is, how do we map out the cognitive spaces that, we, that our, our mind moves within in the same way or in a similar way to um, the spaces that we physically walk in? But I think it opens a lot up a lot of questions about how individuals make their own maps, right? And then how the way that they choose to make that map will then um, affect the way that they may respond in the future to a new uh, context or environment. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I think it also really speaks to the kind of pervasive and circular role of memory, right? Because the maps are dependent on memories. They're built from memories and experiences. So there's this um, kind of dialogue uh, with memory creating maps, maps creating experiences, experiences creating memories, affecting the maps. And it really makes me think even of a question a friend asked me recently about moods and mental health and this feeling of like, how do some people get kind of trapped in a state of mind where all they can see is a particular way forward, um, but then something happens in the world that shifts them to another model. Which is actually really interesting because you can make different maps in different physical spaces too, right? As you walk into a new room, you make a new map of that room. So what are the, the doorways basically for, for mental models? Yeah. And I think that often we sort of fall into this pattern of, of thinking about memory as, as always additive, that we always just keep gathering more information and update what we currently have. We don't as, as often speak about deleting pieces of information or, or perceptions or something that we thought was a, was a useful fact, but actually it's not a fact. Memories as models, or models first, and memory as part of what helps build a model, starts generating new predictions, exactly of the kind you just brought up, uh, or other ways of thinking about things, because an efficient model needs to let go of information. Right? It was just, um, I uh, heard a colleague of mine joking about the fact that the principles of neuroscience textbook keeps growing and growing, and that if we had enough um, strength in theoretical neuroscience, if our models of neuroscience were good enough, that book should shrink back. We know that memory retrieval is essentially construction, and so you don't need to store all those separate memories. You need to construct them. But if you have a good model, let go of all those details and just construct them to feel as if it's a memory. But really, all that you're doing is using the model to fill the details. It's kind of like the matrix, you know? <laughs> it's getting way out there. But, um, but it is a way in which if you have the right model, it should be an efficient one. I wonder what you, th what you think about um, what all this means for kind of a redefinition of what memory is. In many ways, a, a, a revision or expansion of that notion. And would you be willing to try to help me <laughs> think yeah. about yeah. how to define it? I think it's information, um, certainly, that ha that is stored in the brain and that can then affect our behavior. I think getting a behavior in there somewhere seems seems important. But also, is it just a record of the past, or is it you know our perceptions of of what happened in the past, or or how we've changed? Uh, how we think about that past event, or have we deleted that event completely and then gathered this higher level structure uh, or mental model that then allows us to behave differently in the future. So it's more alive, it's more changing, it's more, um, I think it's bubbling out in gathering, gathering and growing and becoming more flexible, but it's also sort of bubbling in, in the sense of deleting and removing and forgetting. Um, so, Yes, I think that what we need to add perhaps is that changeability and the perhaps the behavioral relevance of that changeability. Yeah. I don't know, what do you think? I, I agree. I, I think, you know, as, as you were speaking, I was thinking the, the, maybe the most important word to replace there is record. The record implies an etching of something as it was. And maybe what we need instead is that it's a model. Yeah. Um, it's an approximation. It's an abstraction um, that can help us create the illusion of constructing a record, but that it's the model that's the important thing that drives the whole thing. Yeah, you know? yeah, I agree. I think that's yeah. perfect. Yeah. I hope you learned something about memory. It plays a role in shaping the changing preferences of things we encounter in our lives. Memory is fundamental to everything we do, to who we are, to what we order for breakfast, to how we think about our past, to how we plan our future.